hyperspatially speaking. It's hyperspatially. <laughs> Just to correct one thing, uh, I'm not Joe Parr's assistant. Uh, I'm an independent researcher, and uh, Joe Parr happens to be uh, an excellent researcher, and he contacted me, and, and we, we struck up a good relationship of doing some basic research. Is this thing not on? No, you got to talk to the other way. Oh, through this one? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, Joe Parr's uh, experiments were uh, very interesting. He contacted me about 10 years ago, and, and the reason he contacted me was some research that I'd done for detecting gravity waves uh, with uh, piezoelectrics and some other stuff, and Joe had been there and done that. And so we started collaborating, and uh, he eventually uh, started revealing a lot of the stuff he'd been doing, and I uh, ended up uh, duplicating one of his experiments. And as a result, uh, it fit in with some other research that I'd been doing on shape far power for about 35 years. And what this talk's going to do is it's going to review some of the basic uh, shape power review the shape power physics that I discussed in my uh, book, Shape Power. And then from there, we're going to kind of marry the effects that Joe Parr discovered and show how this can lead to possible space drive. Uh, the effects are pretty dramatic, and I, I think they kind of speak for themselves. The uh, Everybody having fun? Is this a good conference? Yeah. Yeah. What we have here is a little laser pointer. Just think, 35 years ago, uh, I was working at, at one of the research facilities up in Palo Alto, and uh, one of the companies across the road had invented the basic Ruby laser, and this thing was a big, humongous thing. You know, weighed a lot, had. Uh, cooling systems and everything to keep the thing from burning up on them, had big power supplies. And inside of 35 years, the thing is down to a handheld device that'll powered by a couple of flashlight batteries. This is where technology is moving today. And I, I think, you know, you, you see something, you know, somebody like me get up here and talking about shape power and things, and people ask me, well, are we ready to build this perfect space drive? And I say, well, where we're at in all this is back where Ben Franklin was flying the kite or Faraday was using static electricity to make the frog kick. You know, we're about at that stage in understanding a lot of this new technology. You get a lot of theoreticians getting up there and, and talking about different theoretical ideas, but very few of them get in there and do any real experiments. And that's one of the things I've tried to encourage people to do is, is to reveal uh, enough details so people can duplicate what I'm doing and what, what some of the other people are doing that I've discovered. Uh, to get back to shape power, shape power is, is basically the phenomena whereby physical shapes are converted to, for by the ether into other forces. And this was the, the basic definition that I worked out and has proven in the laboratory. Now the way all this got, got started, uh, I'd been doing a lot of pyramid research back in the late 50s and early 60s and could never really come to a conclusion on the thing. And uh, one of the things that popped out a lot of that research that I and, and other researchers came up with was you don't need a completely solid pyramid to make the effects happen. All you need is a wire frame defining all of the edges, you know, the four, four, corners, uh, four squares of the base, the four lines, and the, and the four uh, lines that make up the peak. And from this, I got to thinking about uh, you know, what's happening here? What's, what's the physics behind this? And I had proven uh, several years ago uh, that basic effects of the interatomic structure is, t is that it interacts with the local space field. Now, we've got a lot of new names that have come up like zero-point energy and space energy and things like this, but it's really just another name for the ether. And, but, it, but it's a different ether than, than existed back in the last century. Now, if, if a lot of you have had any experience with a lot of the experiments that went on, uh, 
back in the, the early part of the century, supposedly the Michelson-Morley experiment uh, obviated the ether. And that's why physics went down this track that there was no ether. And they invented things like quantum electrodynamics and things like this to try and explain what's going on uh, with physical phenomena. But they've kind of run up into a, a brick wall. And as a real result, what has happened is that the, uh, they have invented or supposedly discovered the zero point energy field which is kind of a, a quantum soup of energy that from which all matter comes out of. But one of the things that we've proved mathematically and also in the lab is that the, the uh, atomic structure of matter is hooked right into the local space field. And if you, you look at this little diagram, this is kind of a, a simple way of, of describing it. If you think of these as atoms down in a, in a material, it's got little hooks here into the local space field. So what happens is, is that if you, if you think of a line here, this, this line here is, is like this, this line of atoms, except there's trillions and trillions of atoms in this line. And you've got another line that's close to it. The local space field here starts interacting with, with the ether. And since there's other interaction on this line, you start getting an interacting effect between the two lines. Now, because this interaction is uh, torsion or vortexual in nature, this thing creates an actual vortex in the ether. And this can be measured in the laboratory. And, and I've done it with, with several types of instruments. But basically, a, a vortex in the ether is a magnetic field. You know, you, you hear all this stuff about the right hand law and the left hand curl and all of this stuff in, in electronics. Well, that all comes about because the, all the electrons and the atoms in the magnetic material are hooking into the ether locally and creating a macromagnetic field. And this is what happens with the line here is that you can actually measure a magnetic field. And I've also had clairvoyants take a look at this. And they can see this vortex being formed. So when I came up with this wild and crazy idea. I called up my friend Joe Parr. I knew he had just bought a nice uh, magnetometer, measures magnetic fields down to a very low level. And I told him what I'd come up with. And he's, he says, well, what do, you, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, I want you to take some kind of a non-conductor, uh, rods of some kind, and, and uh, have them all go down into a point and see if you can measure any effects. So. He had a bunch of chopsticks with sharp points on them, so he stuck them all into a styrofoam ball. And uh, lo and behold, he measured 40 volts per meter down here at the apex of where they were all converging. And he was getting about uh, a milligauss, or 0.01 microteslas, as far as a magnetic field. Now, this is rather interesting, because here you have a wooden material, the chopsticks, and the styrofoam also is a non-conductor uh, creating a magnetic field, which to me validated the basic ideas. So I continued to do the, uh, I, as soon as he told me that this thing worked, I got some parts together and I built me a fluxgate magnetometer, which is even more sensitive than what he had, and, and was able to quantify a lot of the uh, actual effects that go on. You know, the, the more lines you have together, the bigger the magnetic field and this sort of thing. So this is all explained in excruciating detail in the Shape Power book. Now, one of the effects that we've come up with, uh, if you go harken back to the old research that uh, Wilhelm Reich did, he was the discoverer of orgone energy. And orgone energy, uh, in my mind, at least, is another name for the ether. It has all of the same effects that you see. And what Reich really discovered was that silk, wool, and wood all transmit the ether very readily. And things like metals, uh, zinc, iron, uh, steel, whatever, transmit it much slow slower. Well, one of the things that, that I discovered was that polyester materials, plastics, practically block the ether totally. And Th this was kind of an interesting effect. And we've been experimenting with this in the lab to, to try and figure out some way of, of using 
the, the plastic materials as well as conductors to find some way of amplifying the energy. And kind of theoretically, if, if you've ever gotten into the chemistry of uh, plastics, they're basically long chain hydrocarbons uh, that are uh, randomly oriented. So they're all jumbled up like a bunch of knots. And I think this effect effectively cancels the, the flow of ether through it. It acts like a, a sump, so to speak. What I'm doing here is, is taking a lot of effects, and I'm going to show you where I'll lead in a minute here. One of the things that, that I had been searching for for years was a, a way of measuring uh, the, eth the ether or the effects around different things. And, and one of the things that I discussed in the Shape Car book was the use of uh, uh, very high dielectrics as detectors for the space energy. And this, this, you can actually build a, a detector that'll measure the amount of stress in the local etheric field using this. Well, this is what kind of triggered Joe Parr uh, to contact me and told me that he had developed some other sensors that were even better. It turns out that dielectrics are very sensitive to uh, heat and also s electrostatics. So it's very difficult to separate out the heat and electrostatic effects. You know, you have to build some special uh, laboratory equipment and put the dielectrics in special oven control containers so that the temperature is constant, things like that. And as a result, it, it makes it difficult to use it as a direct sensor. Well, one of the things that Joe Parr had discovered was that you could put a radioactive sensor inside the pyramid and that it would attenuate the amount of radioactivity. Now, the other amazing thing was that the, the attenuation varied uh, during the year, and at some times, it would totally close off the amount of radioactivity that they would be emitting out of the pyramid. And so this, <coughs> you know, if you follow this through, he says, well, if this will attenuate radioactivity, what else will attenuate? So he put sound sources in it, he put uh, electromagnetic sources, you know, running things from DC to light, and it attenuated all of them during these special times of the year. Uh, the other thing that, that all broke out of this, the, the final result was that the, the pyramid creates a, a spherical force field centered at the one-third height level of the pyramid. Now, if you think about all of the pyramid energy stuff, uh, this, the, the one-third height level is the geometric center of the pyramid. So it's kind of the, the focus of the mass, it's the focus of all the geometry of the pyramid. And if there were energies being created at the corners, they would all be focused right there at the one-third height level. And of course, the one-third height level is, is well known within uh, any of the pyramid books you read is that this is the place where you get the maximum effects. Like if you stick a, a piece of meat or something in there, it'll dry maximally at that one-third height level. So uh, what, what Joe Pard was, was an was a me a instrument uh, measurement able to prove that this was where the maximum center was for, for all the energy. And that around the outside of the pyramid is a force field. It's a, a spherical force field. Like if you, if you got the pyramid here, there's, there's actually a, a spherical force field around the outside of it. And this force field, uh, in the intensity of it, uh, or the, uh, you might think of the opacity of it. In other words, if you think about this wall, it doesn't transmit light very well, but if it was a piece of glass, it would transmit it very well. Well, the, this force field around the pyramid is like that. And, but it, but it's, it, its opacity to passing any kind of energy changes throughout the year. And this discovery really led Joe to the possibility that there may be uh, some kind of a space drive possibility here because it did totally cancel out the gra local gravity effects. And this was one of the Can everybody see that okay? Th this is one of the early experiments that Joe built up. It's, it's, I call it the centrifuge. It's kind of a, a strange device. It's, all, it's explained in real detail in the Shape Hour book, if you ever get it. But the, it has a motor here up at the top, uh, far enough away from, from the real moving parts so that it, the uh, fields from the motor don't affect it. 
Here's a, there's an arm here that gets spun by the motor, and on the end of this arm are two pyramids on the end of each end of it. And they spin around through this circular chamber here, and these are, are magnets alternating north, south, south, north all the way around. So what happens is, is this, these pyramids move in and out of these magnets as it goes around and has an alternating magnetic field, an alternating north-south magnetic field on the pyramids. And that at certain times of the year, uh, these little eight gram, one inch base pyramids would go ripping off the end with as much as uh, 113,000 times increase in gravitational energy. So th this is obviously way over unity, you know, 113,000 times over unity. It's gravitational. It does. It, what, ha what happened was that these pyramids would rip off and tear up the whole chamber on the inside. They rip downward? No, they, they, rip, rip, they rip straight out. Well, it be centrifugal. No, it wasn't. It wasn't even close to the amount of energy it was getting centrifugally. Much greater than your calculator. Much greater than any kind of inertial forces. What did you say the name of the book was that describes all this? Shape power. Shape power? Shape power. Okay. Yeah. Steve got it over there in the library, I think, for sale. Shape power. You know, shape. Yes. Okay. Uh, because the centrifuge experiment was so destructive, he couldn't even control the amount of forces. He he, he built another smaller version of it with uh, smaller uh, pyramids and and worked differently. And he was he was getting. Uh, plastic pyramids that got totally exploded and ripped into parts and everything else. And it was just an unbelievable amount of power that he was getting out of this and he had no way of controlling it. So what he did was he said, well, maybe there's a two-dimensional analog of this. So he took and he built a device which I called the gravity wheel. And it consists basically of a uh, PC board that's had everything etched away out of it except little triangles all around the outside. See, it's got like, like a little sawtooth wheel. And each one of these little triangles is isolated electrically. In other words, there's, there's a little break in between each one of them. And this is very important that you have to have that. And around the outside, just like in the centrifuge, are these alternating uh, magnets on each side of it. And a little small motor that'll run up to 10,000 RPM. And so when you spin this whole thing, you're, you, you've got a a triangle spinning around in and out of these magnetic fields. And this, this was really the first uh, use of an array, basically. You know, an array is a, a group of the same shapes hooked together, spun on a shaft. And uh, when he first did the experiments, uh, and when he did the, uh, the centrifuge experiment as well as the gravity wheel experiment, he was able to trigger this force field effect by using a uh, high voltage electrostatic force. In other words, he pumped, uh, I think it was negative ions into the uh, force, I into the local space around the experiment, and this would feed that force field. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make it intense, but it would create the energy matrix so that another energy could create the force field for it, which he found later. So when this, this thing was first experimented, when I first uh, did the first experiments on it, I was using an electrostatic uh, generator, you know, like one of these room ion generators to, to trigger the whole thing. Well, Joe became interested in uh, the, the basic structure of the Great Pyramid itself and had a uh, friend of his do an analysis of the acoustic properties of the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid. And they came up with about seven or eight frequencies uh, but he didn't take into account the, the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. So what he basically had was the range of frequencies that this chamber resonates to. And this gave him some resonation factors. And what he did is he built a sound generator that, that stimulated this experiment and ran it. You know, you've you got to really appreciate what Joe's done. Every day he would increment this frequency by a tenth of a hertz from 10 hertz clear up through about 600 or 1,000 hertz. And this, this took a couple years of, ex, of excruciatingly detailed experiments, and he finally located a few resonance points which would trigger the same effect that the electrostatics would. And one of them happens to be 
51.287 hertz. Now, anybody that's done a lot of pyramid research knows that that number is the base angle of the Great Pyramid. So what we've got is gravity resonances with, space, with shape. Recently, uh, Joe's just been trying to find some other frequencies. Uh, he had some problems. He called me up here uh, last spring and said, uh, Dan, would you run your gravity wheel experiment again? He says, I'm, my system's died. <laughs> this, is, this thing had just quit on him. He wasn't getting any pulses. And this is a system that gets, you know, it's setting on a scale, and the scale measures the, the, the amount of times that it goes anti-gravitic. So he was, you know, on average, he's probably getting 1,500 to 10,000 pulses a day. And on a day when you were going through one of these huge energy fields that are created, he was getting a couple hundred thousand to a, couple, to a million pulses a day. And, and he called me up and said, it's gone dead. You know, it's like Spock t talking to uh, Kirk, and he, and he says, to, there's this alien on the ground. He says, I think it's dead, Jim. <laughs> it's dead. So he says, could you run it? So I ran mine, and it's working great. You know, I got 23,000 pulses the first day I turned it on, which is kind of unusual because it, it takes about a half a day for the thing to even build up and, and start uh, resonating properly. So Joe gets, gets to cranking away, takes his whole experiment apart, and what he really found out was that the, the little triangular teeth there was a metal, an unknown metal, being precipitated onto those triangles and filling up the void between each triangle and totally shorting them out. So he, he saved, luckily he saved this metal, and he's trying to get it analyzed right now. And this metal, unknown, uh, is, is going it, to, you know, it, it's, it's a conductor, has very low conductivity. Uh, it's, it's kind of a grayish metal. He's, he's done a few tests on it, can't, he still doesn't know what it is. He's trying to find a uh, mass spectrometer uh, lab that'll run the experiments for him. But uh, as, as part of this latest research, he's discovered some other resonance effects. Remember we just mentioned the 51 to, uh, hertz frequency. He's also found that the, the Schumann resonance frequency, which is the basic frequency that resonates within the uh, Earth cavity, uh, between the ionosphere and the surface of the Earth is, is also one of the resonance frequencies. Now, this original frequency is a fixed frequency. It does not change. But these new frequencies that he's discovered vary based on the local time of uh, what's, what's going on within the Schumann resonance frequency. Uh, the other frequency, which is, is almost a multiple but a little more, is around 26.7. Of course, the Schumann, everybody knows, is between seven and nine or somewhere in that vicinity. The other thing that he, that he found out was that uh, the phase of the moon affects resonance. Uh, when the moon is visible, the resonant effects drop off. And, and what we're theorizing here is that the moon creates an additional stress within the local etheric field, and it somehow affects the experiment. Uh, the other thing that's, that's been discovered, and he's been uh, done a lot of experiments with it, He's got some high-speed oscilloscopes and been able to measure this energy particle. There is a particle that, that, that triggers this entire effect and causes the uh, varying levels of opacity within the force field around it. And this energy particle is the initiator of all the gravity effects. Uh, but this, this latest discovery about the metal is quite interesting because apparently this energy particle is getting converted to this unknown metal in the experiment. How am I doing on time? Five hours. Five hours. This is the sonic version of the, the gravity wheel. Um, basically, it's just uh, the gravity wheel set up here. Got a couple of woofers, one on each side. Um, they're, they really, you have to get some good woofers because they have to be able to go down to about 20 hertz. And this is just a little 9 volt power supply uh, driving a special little signal generator. You could use an, a regular audio signal generator if you wanted to as long as it's stable. 
driving it at, at, this, at this particular frequency was a stable frequency, and then running it through a little simple 7 watt amplifier to drive the woofers. More spooky resonance effects, obviously. So what do we get from these conclusions of the gravity wheel? One is that the, the pyramid shape is tuned to forces that exhibit gravity effects, and the triangles as well as three-dimensional pyramids are tuned similarly, and that there is an energy particle which tri triggers these gravitational effects. Now, the, another area that, that I've been doing extensive research in for about 35 years uh, is arrays of different shapes, and specifically this picture here shows uh, three by uh, five pyramid array, and you get some interesting effects by doing this. Back in the 60s and 70s, I think uh, Flanagan and a few other people used to sell these little pyramid plates with these little uh, <coughs> pyramids on them. This, this was one of the things that was being hawked by the, the people that were selling pyramid, pyramid type uh, things. Another thing that's, that's popped up for all this shape power is, is a kind of a set of rules or heuristics. Now, I don't know if you got to the point where you could call these laws, but it seems that the size of the shape is immaterial to the amount of power it has, which really leads to some interesting effects. Uh, for example, if you took the Great Pyramid, which is huge, I mean, this thing weighs thousands and thousands of tons, covers many acres, versus a little tiny one-inch pyramid, and they both have the same amount of pyramid power. So if you had arrays of these things, you know, if you had arrays of the Great Pyramid, that'd be kind of hard, but if you take arrays that are, that are very minute, you know, like maybe a few microns on a side, you can get tremendous amplification effects using an arrayed principle. The other thing that I've found is that arrays focus the energy for individual elements. In other words, when you get some macro energy effects by putting rays together. And the rays can be either two or three dimensional. This happened to be a, a two dimensional array that I uh, put in the Shape Power book. There wasn't too much discussion on it. But basically, it's it's a bunch of curve lines. You know, the, the ether likes to follow uh, vortexial patterns. So I created a two-dimensional thing, you know, using a laser printer. And here you see lines that are far apart here and getting closer together. So you've got your basic uh, phenomena to create the, the shape power uh, effect. And if you take and concatenate a bunch of these lenses together, you can actually intensify the amount of ether. Now, each lens gathers, like here's a lens, it gathers the amount of energy behind it based on its local space size. The next uh, array, two-dimensional array in here collects all the energy in its space as well as all the energy that it picked up here. So uh, we've had clairvoyants look at this stuff, and they can actually see a highly intense uh, beam of energy coming off after you've got three levels of two-dimensional arrays. Another way of intensifying the effects. So what are the implications of arrays? Gravitation, the single shape produces a little bit of gravitational effect. What does a lot of arrays do? Or what do a lot of those shapes put together in an array do? They, they, will, they, will, macro, they will magnify until you get macro energy effects. Uh, free energy, if you've got, for example, Joe Parr and, and I've both measured uh, electrostatic effects. The, the pyramid actually creates electrons, creates electrostatic effects. Mm -hmm. By using arrays, you can create large electrostatic effects. So if you've got microscopic arrays with trillions of, of these array elements, you can create large macroscopic energy effects, gravity, free energy. So where are we headed with all this? Well, natural arrays. Does nature do any of this crazy stuff? Turns out that crystals are natural arrays. 
The problem with crystals is that they're closed structures, so you don't get anywhere near the effects. One of the things that we've discovered is that, is that the array has to be available to the local space. So you have to have an open spatial array. Uh, inside the brain, if you get down into the fine-grained structure of the brain, the microscopic level, a lot of the neuroglia, they call them, have little spiral vortexes stacked up one on top of each other. And these, are, these act like parametric amplifiers to increase the amount of energy of whatever they're tuned into. If you look at a tree, the leaves on the tree, you've got converging lines all over that tree. The, the branches, the leaves, everything are natural energy collectors. Power amplification with shape power arrays. From, your shape, from the shape power book, we found that the circle concatenates, concentrates etheric energy to the center. A tube, if you think of a tube, is like a bunch of stacked circles. And if you array the tubes, you can get a very large number of uh, concentration of energy effects. One of the things that Wilhelm Reich discovered is a cloud buster. And what he did was he took a bunch of pipes, arrayed them all together, and pointed them at clouds and ground the other end and the thing would create clouds or dissipate them depending on how you biased the, the array. Uh, you can also do small experiments like this yourself. You get it yourself a bundle of straws and you can create a little energy beam transmitter. You gotta play around with it to find out how to bias it. One of the suggested experiments that uh, I've come up with and, and where we're going to go with this is a way to advance some of the gravity wheel effects and, array, and marry them with the array effects. Now, I mentioned the extreme inertial effects that Joe Parr got with the 3D uh, version of the centrifuge. And the centrifuge was terminated because the amount of energy was so great he couldn't control the experiment. I mean, he'd get things, he was wrecking his uh, experimental setup. And, you know, if you saw that at centrifuge, it's non-trivial. You know, it's a lot of money built into that thing. So what I've come up with is a new experimental design that, that Joe and I are thinking of building. And it's basically a use of, of both of three-dimensional effects with arrays on a circular uh, system. What, what the system, this is kind of a, a high level view of the thing. You've got the, the yellow here is, a, think of it as maybe a plate of some type with pyramids welded or something to the surface all the way around. And then you've got a stator out here that has little magnets that are, you know, I didn't show the rest of it because it kind of messes up the picture, but think of it as, as this stator being able to hold these two magnets so that the pyramids will rotate in between them. And as this thing, this yellow plate rotates, these pyramids will move in and out of the magnetic fields. So how much theoretical power lift, whatever can we get out of this thing? Now, th these are very conservative numbers. Uh, if the weight of the pyramid is two ounces, you've got 24 pyramids on a rotor and the amplification is about 100,000 X and you get energy pulses about 0.05 per second which is the average pulse on a day when we're not in any kind of a big energy field and the pulse duration is 0.05 seconds happens to be longer than that in a lot of cases the total lift is 750 pounds of lift interesting huh? So what's the next step? Where are we headed with all these crazy wild ideas? Experimenting with arrays for power and gravitational effects. Uh, that's really where I'm at. I'm interested in creating a 
true space drive. And the uh, hypothesis is that uh, the key to all of this is, is arrays of uh, shape power, uh, large arrays, now not physically large, but large <coughs> numbers of the shape set up to create these macro energy and gravity effects through, you know, through the array multiplication. Conclusions? Pretty obvious by now, right? We've, we've proven in the lab, I don't know if anybody else has ever gotten down to doing the experiments, but Joe Parr and we've done these things simultaneously in Arizona and California. We've proven that etheric energy gets converted into other forces using shape. I mean, just simple shapes. Specific shapes are resonant to specific frequencies and have anti-gravity effects. They have uh, free energy effects. We've got instrumentation that we can measure these effects. And we think that the key to gravitation and free energy, in other words, gravity control and free energy is shape power rays. And we're on a search to identify the optimum rays to do this. Thank you. Question? Yeah, I have a question for you. On the pyramid that you showed there, is it just a flat bottom standard pyramid, or is there a pyramid uh, below it, like the pyramid base? No, it's just a standard flat bottom pyramid. And uh, mm -hmm. I forgot his first name, but Carr was working with neutron, neutron coils, or neutron, uh, they were cones with the bases connected together, and they were slightly tilted in the rotor. Oh, that's Otis, Otis T. Carr? Otis, yeah. Yeah. Otis T. Carr. yeah. Yeah, a, fr a friend of mine actually built those coils. The, the experiment uh, never worked. And it was because Carr decided he didn't like the way my friend, who had already knew how all this stuff worked, uh, changed the way the experiment was structured as far as his, uh, that flying, flying saucer craft that Carr built back in the 40s or 50s, whenever it was. It was quite a while ago. But it's, it was probably the same kind of effect, because a, a cone is also another shape power uh, device, obviously. Uh, what the ether, okay, she asked what I think of the ether is. The, the ether is the energy that we all live, move, and have our being in. It's the energy that creates matter. It, it is the basic building block of matter. You know, matter is ether in bondage. And Keeley proved this in the lab back in the end of the last century. He used sound force to to impinge in a certain way upon uh, like water or, or any other mass. He, he first worked with water because it was easier to work with and was able to convert water to pure ether and control the ether both mentally and with other, other me mechanisms. It's, it's also the force that builds the universe. <coughs> Yes. Okay, uh, he asked, what are the best material to make arrays out of uh, since silk and wool and natural uh, products like wood are uh, good conductors and of course metals and other things aren't? Uh, it turns out that the metals are the best for some types of arrays and wood is good for others. I mean, it just depends on what kind of array you're messing with. Uh, the the two-dimensional array that I showed there with, with the uh, circle and the curved lines on it, that particular array was made with paper, which is a good conductor, and it's made from wood fibers. And the material on it is uh, carbon. They posited, you know, basically your, your laser printer is a, uh, the, the ink is a, is a carbon type material. So they're both non-conductors but because of the density difference between the two of them, they create the shape power effect. It's all explained in, in a lot of detail. The physics is explained in detail in the shape power book. Yes, sir. Uh, about three questions. Um, do you use uh, three-sided or, or four-sided pyramids on the gravity wheel? And what is the apex angle? Is that like the great pyramid? And uh, is there any connection to the company ground experiments uh, with the uh, shape? Okay, uh, 
basic question, is it a four-sided four pyramid? Uh, is it uh, same angle as the uh, Great Pyramid? And the other was, is it the same as this Townsend Brown effect with his shapes? Uh, answer number one, the, uh, the it's, it's, they're, they're four-sided. The four-sided are the ones we've used because that gives you the best effect. The three-sided don't align up very well with the magnetic field. If you look at the Great Pyramid, it's got four sides, and you know the sides face north, south, east, west almost perfectly, and that's where you get the maximum effects from it. Is is this a magnetic field across the pyramid? The the angles, the particular pyramids we've <coughs> used have been uh, based on the geometry of the Great Pyramid, but we found that it doesn't make much difference. In other words, you could go to an equal-sided uh, triangles on all of the faces if you wanted to. It's easier to build that way, by the way. As far as the angle at the top, like I said, it, it's the stuff we've, uh, it's the Great Pyramid. The, the last question was, is it the same as the Townsend Brown? No, this is not the same as the Townsend Brown effect. The Townsend Brown effect was an electrostatic effect, and he was amplifying it using <coughs> parabolic shapes. And that, if you go to the patent, you can see that that's what he was doing. And there's also an old movie, a little clip of a piece of movie film left where you can see that's what he was doing. So it's no, it's not the same effect at all. It's a geometric effect focusing with par parabola. I just noted the similarity of the, the arrays that he was using to uh, <coughs> some of the arrays that he used to. Uh, mm. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, you had a question? The magnets that are arranged in circles around the gravity wheel or something like that. Uh huh. Centrifuge, are those alternating north south waves? Yes, that's what I said. The chest is the, uh, the magnets that are aligned around the, the gravity wheel or the centrifuge, are they alternating magnetic fields? And they, yes, they are north, south, south, north, all the way around, so that when the pyramid goes in and out of those, it, it alternates <coughs> the magnetic field from north to south. So you've got a oscillating magnetic field. Yes, sir? The uh, orientation of the triangles on the wheel, are they oriented radially or, or are they all the way straight up? They're all oriented radially so that the point points straight out along a radius. Well, we've done some experiments with tetrahedrons and a few other shapes. Uh, I don't know how it correlates with the stuff that uh, Hoagland's been doing. No, we, we found other ways to, to mess with the geometry, so we haven't messed with these. <laughs> yes, sir? How does the sound work? Uh, if you use a woofer and create sound while you run this experiment, does it cause the uh, pyramid to fly off and lower RPM or something? Now, what, what the sound does is it sets up the, mat the energy matrix so that these particles that are coming in from outer space will build up that force field. You get a certain amount of it without anything because there's a local electrostatic field. But when you use the sound resonating at the proper frequency, it, it, it's like it draws in the energy or sets up what it, what it we know, we're not sure exactly what happens, but it does um, create the matrix as a way to put it for these effects to happen. Yes. Yeah, yes, there are the, the speakers that are facing each other in phase, and that, the answer is yes. They're setting up a standing wave between the two of them. So, yeah. in regard to the space drive concept, um, you were conducting all the experiments in Earth's gravity. Uh, would you expect uh, the uh, effect to be propulsive if, if you're away from the gravity field? Theoretically, we think it is, yes. Yeah, yes, this is the effect. How, does the effect still work outside the Earth's gravity field? And we think the answer is yes, it does. Because it, it's actually uh, opaque to all the local forces. I mean, the local gravity field has no more effect once that force field's around the pyramid. Yes, sir?
uh, he asked, is the, uh, Townsend Brown apparently did some experiments with some energy that's coming from outer space. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same thing. The, the experiments that I'm familiar with that Townsend Brown worked with were using uh, natural materials like rocks and, uh, well, I think it was mostly rock, different types of rocks as sensors. And they're really the same kind of thing that we were doing with dielectrics and they measure the local space, the stress in the local space field. And yes, they will measure energies that come down into the Earth from outer space, and you can pick them up with, with the type of instrumentation. And they may wear it very well have been the same type of energy, but we don't know. To this day, we still not know, do not know what that energy particle is that we're getting in these energy conduits that go between our sun and the other stellar systems. Anything else? Yes, sir. Are you familiar with uh, James uh, Trevor Constable's work with etheric energy and uh, using uh, weather control, I mean, controlling weather? Yeah, that's what I talked about. Oh, okay. I, did, I missed that somewhere. You were asleep there, right? Yeah. Well, I didn't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I did. I mentioned that. Remember, I was talking about circle. A circle concentrates energy, yeah. and a stack of circles is like a tube. Yeah. And and Reich did a, the original Cloudbuster stuff. Yeah. With, with big pipes and found that they would dissipate or create clouds depending on how he had them biased, you know, whether they were grounded or whatever. And, and uh, the stuff that, uh, what was the guy's name again? I forgot it. James Trevor. Constable. Yeah, yeah, Con Constable <coughs> validated his stuff and has done a lot more research with the Cloudbuster experiments. Well, if they were creating storms and stuff time after time in conditions where there shouldn't have been those storms. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, he, he actually proved this exists. Very good. Sure, you can build anything you want. Uh, you're only limited by your own imagination. <laughs> well, the, I, I mentioned you can take a bundle of straws and, and start playing around with the tube effect. You do get some effects there. Yes? Uh, the speakers. One speaker pushes out, the other pulls in. No, that's what the, he asked. They're both in phase, so they're both pushing like this. Pushing out the same time? Yeah. Okay. But then also, the weather thing. Well, I don't know if it's possible. Yeah, I, I think it is. But it's pretty, enough. yeah. You can find some way to focus the energy into it. That would be you, got a, useful. you got a pretty big vortex there, <laughs> you know, yeah, hundreds of miles across. <laughs> any, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, that's what the whole talk was about. Oh yeah, we, we've seen up to 800% uh, weight loss during one of these these big uh, conduits that the gravity experiment gets in. And you can you can practically see this thing. It's setting on a very sensitive uh, scale. We, we we spent a lot of money, uh, about $1,300, on one of these scales that's computer controlled and everything, and it, and we can measure the the uh, duration of the, the lift, the amount of energy that the pulse has, and the amount of lift we're getting off of the device. The, the experiment sets on a scale. Well, some, some of the conduits, uh, I've stood there and watched the experiment, and it goes completely off the scale. The, the, uh, the scale goes out of calibration because of the lift we're getting off of it. And the, the, the gravity wheel itself only weighs 11 grams. And I've seen up to eight or 900 or 1,000 grams before the scale uh, goes off of calibration. And the time duration? The time duration for a long series of pulses is up to you know, 15, 20 seconds, but these will occur all day long. We've seen, like, like in a typical high energy conduit around December 15th in that time period, uh, it'll run, the, these conduits run all day long. We get millions of pulses all day long. Yeah? Have you had, have you had anything actually get off the table and start floating in the air? Ooh, no. <laughs> no. Nothing floating off the table yet. See, the gravity wheel only weighs 11 grams, yeah. but it's got uh, all of the experimental stuff sitting around it, you know, weighs quite a, it weighs up, I think, almost 18 pounds. 
you know, with the motor and all of that stuff. So even though we see, you know, several thousand grams of lift, it's not enough to overcome the total weight of the experiment. Have you noticed any effects on uh, time? For example, if you put a, a, a sound oscillator in near the uh, gravity wheel, does it change frequency or anything like that? Okay, yes. Is there any uh, time effects associated with the experiment? And we have not seen any, but I've never really, I've set a watch by it and it just still keeps good time. I'm, and I set a watch by it so that I can tell what time of day the thing's going off. You know, I measure pulses a lot of times, one or two times a day when it's running. So what you're really getting at is there's seem any time dilatation effects, you know, due to the gravity of uh, pulses and stuff. No, we, do, we don't know that. We, we haven't never measured anything. Yes? Don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about that. I'm not in a lot of the woo woo stuff. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, he asked does, does clothing have any uh, energetic effects, basically, right? Yeah. Uh, Anytime you're wearing polyester, you're blocking off your aura. I mean, you're shutting yourself down. That's why wearing polyesters and plastics and things are not very good for you. I always wear natural fabrics. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can, and you can also put patterns on there that don't do very good for you either. There are a lot of patterns that are not constructive. Sure, they were probably some kind of uh, energy effects. Plus, a lot of the things that they wore were specially charged by and, and created as a focus. You, you can take matter and, and imbue patterns into it. Yes, sir? I, I missed the start of your talk, and I know you mentioned Joe Power. Is that the same Joe that has the, the Joe cell? No. No, Joe Power is Joe Power. I don't know about this other person. Yes, sir. I mean, ma'am. Okay, the Taurus. Uh, the Taurus is the only stable uh, energy shape that I know of that exists. And as such, it is the shape of all of the subatomic particles that are stable. That is, the electrons and protons are, to are little mini Tauruses of etheric energy. That's the significance. For example, if you take, and, and uh, you've probably seen a cigar smoker or cigarette smoker blow a smoke ring. Well, the smoke ring stays stable until the smoke starts really starts dissipating, until the, the, the basic force of the air quits causing it to move. And what happens is that the, is that's really a stable shape, you know, the torus, the donut shape. So uh, that's why the, the electrons and protons are, are very stable particles because of that. There's a lot of stuff being done by Lucas and Bergman. If you do their search on the internet for their names, uh, they've got a lot of work uh, proving out the uh, toroidal shape of subatomic particles. By the way, their stuff is pretty good. I've, in fact, some of their stuff I put in the Shape Power book. When I created the, the total uh, view of the uh, ether from a science, you know, mathematical theoretical point of view, I included some of their work as well as some work by a couple other researchers, and I tied it all together. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty, f pretty much convinced. I haven't seen anything that really obviates it. Is that the subatomic particles of matter are all toroidal in shape, and that there are very few <coughs> stable uh, subatomic particles. Large particle, 
Okay, yes. Uh, do you see some kind of like a macro or a large particle getting created? Yes, we do. One of the things that happens around the gravity wheel experiment is that all of the little force fields that are around those triangles create a macro force field that it's around the entire experiment. So it, it's like it's multiplying, it's, it's adding the effects so that they all add together to create a large force field. And if you're, if you're at all sensitive to energies, you can walk up and you can feel this force field around the gravity wheel experiment. In fact, you can push on it and it'll cause the scale to move. Yes, ma'am. Cones? Uh, have I done an experiment with cones? Yeah, cones are really uh, infinite side of pyramids or whatever you want to think of. Uh, they don't have to be oriented to the magnetic field, but the basic problem with a cone is that it doesn't have any of these angles at the base. It just has a peak angle. So you don't get the base effects from the angles at the base like you do on a pyramid or a tetrahedron. Yes, sir? Could you give some examples of closing patterns that would not be beneficial? Well, I don't know if I had to get into this, but I'll just tell you, don't mess around with the crop circle patterns, OK? Have you tried die pyramids? <coughs> what pyramids? What pyramid? What's a die pyramid? No. Yeah, well, we've, we've played around with it, but it doesn't do the effects we want. Having a pyramid, the two bases of the pyramid uh, to, together uh, to create a, you know, like a double pyramid. We've just done mostly uh, single pyramids. Yes, sir. Have you figured out any way to possibly extract electricity from the ether using these shapes? If I did, I probably wouldn't be here today. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or I'd be given a totally different talk. <laughs> yes, sir. Are there any uh, apparent uh, physiological effects or even emotional effects from being around these fields? Uh, it just kind of energizes you. They're constructive fields. Yes, ma'am. That's what the last suggested experiment's about, is we're trying to actually create a lift. Yeah, we'll make it float off the table. Right, because if we can get that 750 pounds of lift, or even a few yeah, hundred pounds, oh, hey, yeah, you get three of those, and you can build a little spacecraft. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir? Yeah. Works better horizontal, lined up east and west. It does work, but it's not near as good as lining the shaft up east and west. Yes, sir? And you have a website. I don't have a website, but a lot of the stuff that I talk about is was been stuck on the Keeley net, K-E-E-L-Y net dot com. Thank you. Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, sir. Have you used um, superconductive materials in your experiments? Uh, question, have I used superconductive materials? Um, no. You got to get down to colder temperatures. Uh, we think there's a way of doing room temperature semiconductors based on some of our theoretical analysis, but no, we haven't. 